Our panel consists of uh, Rob Whitehead, who's our Chief Product Officer and Co-Founder of Improbable. Um, Aaron Flynn, who's just joined us in Edmonton to start a new studio that'll be using Unreal and Spatial OS. It's an incredible team already with folks from games like Mass Effect and Dragon Age and a whole bunch of awesome places. And they're working on something really cool. I'm not sure how much Aaron is gonna, is gonna accidentally leak today about our game, but um, hopefully enough that you guys get excited about it. Um, and what's cool about our internal studios, as I'll, as I'll go on to mention, is that it's really going to be very complementary to you guys using our tech as well. And then we've got Josh, um, who's working on probably my all-time favorite uh, special OS game, uh, Scavengers, which if you haven't checked out, I would check out and, and sign up and look at what's happening. Um, Josh is um, well known for working on so many games, but I mean, my personal favorite would be Halo 5, probably, or 4, um, that Josh worked on with a lot of the team from Midwinter. So he'll be talking about his experiences uh, as well. So um, just a quick uh, update on Improbable. Um, over the last year, we've had a lot of great progress, as some of you may have seen. Um, we've now opened up in China, so our infrastructure is going to be uh, available around the world to you. Um, and we've also begun the process of building some small internal studios that are going to be hopefully showing the way, showing the possibilities with our tech, um, and creating a bunch of tools and content that we hope to make as open as possible to our community as well. Um, the first such studio is in Edmonton, and I mentioned a little bit about that. Oh, sorry. The first such studio is in Edmonton, and uh, I mentioned a little bit about some of the people that are there. Um, and I think what's going to be key is when you guys start to see how we're going to be very open about the tools and processes that are being used there. Um, it'll hopefully give you guys more guidance on how to use the Unreal uh, GDK as well. Um, and then finally, I wanted to give you just a little taster of some of the cool games and experiences that are being, being built over the last year. So there's an awesome number of experiences here, ranging from large scale arena experiences, which are bigger in size like Mavericks or uh, Scavengers than have been possible before. Um, MMO experiences, games that kind of blur the line a little bit, like King's Hunt by Vaki or Nostos by Netties, which are using um, our tech to do some interesting things in the metagame, create different kinds of deployment and connections. There's Seed there by Clang, which is a massive uh, social, think of it like the Sims on giant steroids uh, over your own planet. Um, so there's a whole diversity of games being created. And I think you know, what we're hoping to get across today is that not just the Unreal integration being you know, much stronger and in a place for you guys to really be able to start um, playing with it this year, but also the idea that we're now going beyond just MMOs to supporting a whole bunch of different types of games and experiences too. So I'm gonna let uh, Rob jump up and talk a little bit more about the tech. Rob, take it away. Thanks, Simon, and hey, everybody. And Thanks. Clap for Rob. Yes. I don't need no clap. <laughs> Hey, um, I'm Rob, um, so I'm one of the co-founders of Improbable, and I look after our kind of product suite, so Spatial OS and our game engine integrations. And in terms of the stuff I'm gonna run through, I'm gonna kick off with just a brief intro to Spatial OS for those of you who kind of haven't seen it before. Um, after that, like a recap of what's been going on last year, and we've been working on a lot of really cool technology and really moving the tech forward. And then afterwards, kind of do a bit of a dive into the Unreal Game Development Kit from a technical perspective. So kind of where that came from as a, as a kind of uh, as a thing we built and the story behind it and a bit of kind of how it works under the hood. So yeah, let's, let's kick off. So what is what is Spatial OS? So Spatial OS is a cloud platform which we make as improbable, which lets you um, build and host multiplayer games, um, simply put. Um, so what does that really mean? Like what things do we do for you? So one of the main things we do for you is hosting. So you no longer have a cloud provider, you run on an us on our servers, and we under the hood are kind of running on different cloud providers for you, but we, we manage that hosting for you. Um, we have online services. So besides just running, you know, your dedicated servers, games are far more than that. There's, there's things like matchmaking, things like authentication, things like persistent player data. Um, we're getting involved with those things as well because those things are just as important as your servers. If they go down, you can have a bad time. Um, multiplayer tools. So we aren't just the operational environment. We're not the place where once you've built your game, you kind of phone us up and you deploy. Um, we're a suite of tools you use from day one when you start working in your game with early prototypes and tests. And you use those same tools to scale up into larger kind of um, larger scale when you start to do early access and then go into full production. Um, and finally, it's, we have this kind of unique networking stack, and this is kind of our runtime. And um, we've talked a lot about this in, in the past as well. And this is the kind of special source that lets us make new types of gameplay and kind of game um, scenarios that you've never already seen before without it. So let's kind of zoom into that and, and see kind of how it works and what's going on. So on the left hand side here, you have like a traditional um, dedicated server based game. So you all know about Unreal. This is how like almost every Unreal game kind of looks. You have, you know, from your Fortnite to your PUBGs. Um, you have a dedicated server that runs uh, in a data center somewhere or on a cloud, and all the clients connect into that dedicated server. So that dedicated server is doing pretty much everything. It's doing networking, working out what each client needs to see and sending data to them. 
It's doing simulation of kind of if this AI is doing kind of like those behavior trees and pathfinding. It's doing physics if you have any physics going on. It generally does everything. And, and this is a kind of great paradigm for smaller scale kind of action experiences. But as you scale out, you're going to run into fundamental limitations of what a single kind of machine can do. Um, and Unreal itself, you know, it, it can use part between like one and two cores. So you can't really get further than that. So Spatial OS on the right hand side is kind of a reimagination of that but still preserving the same kind of tools and, and workflows you're familiar with. So on the server side now, rather than having just one dedicated server for a game instance, you can actually have more than one um, and actually different types of process as well. And the idea there is you can actually scale the amount of kind of computation and the amount of simulation going on there far beyond what a single dedicated server could deal with. And additionally, um, you have kind of a, a networking layer which we've built, which all the clients connect into, which is doing the heavy lifting of working out, you know, what data people need to see. And again, that's offloaded from, um, from the server. So to zoom in like one more level of enhance, um, here you can kind of see what it looks like from an infrastructural view. So you have clients and you have, you know, your dedicated servers still, but rather than them directly communicating to one another, there's this kind of runtime layer in between. So this is actually running really close to where the dedicated servers are running. So it's super low latency. Um, and it's also a distributed system. So it's not just a single server, which is another bottleneck. It actually horizontally scales. You can have like five, 10, 100 machines all doing that work of communicating with clients. So you get kind of two benefits um, where you get the fact that now you can have loads and loads of clients connecting into that system because it can deal with all the networking and all the data it needs to send out. Um, and then on the other side, you can now connect in not just a single dedicated server, for your instance, but many of them. And this kind of runtime stitches together all the different bits of simulation happening from those different servers and creates this kind of aggregate environment, which is much bigger than any single dedicated server could deal with. So we've talked a hell of a lot in the past of our company about these amazing, massive, sim living world, simulated, persistent MMOs before. And it's something we've been really passionate about. But what we've come to learn about Spatial OS is it's just generally a good paradigm for building pretty much any type of online game. And you don't need to dial everything up to 11 when you're kind of exploring with ideas. You can start with something you're familiar with and kind of uh, incrementally innovate. So what that concretely means, if you think about scale, yeah, people might want to have social hubs with thousands of players inside of them, but there's nothing stopping you also having spatial OS deployments which have you know, four players and more of a traditional PVE experience together as well. Um, in terms of simulation, you can start by having a more traditional PVP game which doesn't have too much physics and doesn't have you know, any NPCs on the server side. But equally, you can kind of grow that as you want to, to kind of have much more rich stuff happening on the, on the back end, things like persistent destruction or adding in things like kind of a really complex AI with complex behavior. And on the persistent side, yeah, we've, we've talked a lot about spatial OS being like an MMO technology. And yeah, we have a kind of a, a persistent system and snapshotting system that means that your game worlds can last in and kind of live for years at a time if you want but there's nothing stopping them running for minutes if you want to do a more traditional session-based experience. And also this ability to kind of mix and match, which a lot of more modern games are composed of, so things like social hubs or kind of instances um, all kind of stitched together to form one big game experience. So this is kind of an overview of what Spatial OS is as a kind of core technology, but it'd be good to talk about what we've been up to last year because there's been a lot of uh, new things going on which we want to share. So the first one is um, a kind of internal project we codenamed Kraken. Um, so 2018 was a year we had some like sort of games going into full blown production and like as you know real technology hitting like sort of real production with real players playing it you learn a lot of lessons and it was an opportunity to reflect on where we wanted to kind of go next and one of the things we wanted to be working on is around the kind of predictability and scalability of our system um, with kind of our early partners, we were working with them very closely to use Spatial OS to build those new experiences. Um, but we wanted to make something that was going to be easy, even easier to use, kind of hit much higher scale like in, in terms of like on the upper end, and also scale back down as well. Like we want it so people can use the same tools to build smaller and larger game experiences. And we undertook a project called Kraken, uh, as I mentioned, to kind of really kind of push that technology to, to its next level. So what are the results like? So you can see our V1 runtime, um, which we kind of had knocking around in 2017. The operations per second term here is probably worth explaining. So this is the, the kind of metric we came up with, which is kind of a way of understanding the intrinsic complexity of, of kind of a game world. So an operation is anything which changes in the world, which is either kind of um, written to or read from. So a concrete example would be if a player moves, that would be generating one write if they kind of moved you know, in, in one frame. But if 10 people observed that movement, that would be 10 reads. So that would be 11 operations. 
So you can see with 250,000 operations per second, you can start to build some pretty big game experiences. And, and that's actually a, a number from a, a game which had about 1,000 concurrent players and half a million physical objects. But with our benchmarks we've been working on recently, we've been starting to like, hit basically into around like 6 million operations per second. And that's just to start. We have a raft of optimizations coming in. And to kind of like map that into more concrete terms of games, and um, that's like 6,000 people in an action experience with high fidelity tick rates. Um, or if you kind of dial that down for a more traditional MMO experience, that's kind of getting towards about 20,000 concurrent players you can get inside that instance. And as I said before, it's, it's just a start. But the whole point here is it's about creating this bigger box for you to play in. So we've given you like a bigger box to play in, but another thing we've been learning is alongside that, we need to give developers like tools to actually understand and diagnose games that are starting to reach that scale. And this is kind of one of the tools we've been working on, um, which is our new inspector. So this is actually a real-time data debugging system, which allows you to debug any piece of data running inside your game at any point in time, chop and change it, pivot it different ways. Um, and you can see with the flow-based programming system, you can actually build your own customized workflows. Maybe you're trying to understand, you know, like sort of NPC balance and you want to see like what types of weapon different um, NPCs have, or you're trying to understand player distribution in the world. You can do this type of stuff and you can do it like locally and you can also do it for live deployments and actually look at real players engaging with your game. So again, it's just a, one of the few tools we've been able to develop. And this tool is actually uniquely empowered by the Kraken project to make something which can stream all the data of a game world in real time. So besides just the kind of raw compute horsepower, which um, this rework has done, it's also allowed us to make some gameplay features which we've always wanted to kind of uh, give to people to make. So one of these we call query-based interest. So when you have a game that goes beyond, say, 20, 30 players, there's an important compute problem, which is as your kind of players are moving around the game environment, it's working out what part of the world they need to see. Because each player can't see everything because it'll totally overload their machines. Um, so traditionally, there are kind of fairly basic approaches you do here. Like one is where you have a bubble around the player. So as the player moves around, anything inside that bubble you see and anything further away you don't. Um, but we've created a far more flexible language, which lets you kind of decide exactly what you want to be seeing at when, what fidelities. And also you can do it completely dynamically. So as the player does different things and as conditions change, you can update that. So I think Aaron's going to talk a bit later about how they're looking to use it in his project um, to actually make some really interesting game experiences. Another area is online services. So a game is not just you know, the instances that make it up. There's so many other things on top of that that are kind of as important as the game instances themselves. And those things have to click together really nicely. So with our kind of early partners, we worked with them to do kind of like one-off um, implementations of online services, help them work with third parties to integrate with Spatial OS. But we've really started to kind of think about um, from our side what, how we want to kind of go into that space. So in 2019, we're going to be doing two things. Um, the first one is we're going to be creating a compute environment that is really suited for running these types of online service. So spatial OS deployments, you kind of have one of them for each game session going on. This is a place to run systems that are global to the entire game. And um, so good examples of things like you know, matchmaking, player authentication, um, you know, back-end player persistence and inventories. Um, and beyond that kind of compute environment, which we're going to give to people, we're also going to be giving an ecosystem of service content, which you can kind of get started from and build. And this is kind of built with the same philosophy we've approached with our GDKs, which is being API first. So there's a lot of things out there which are kind of very opinionated backend offerings, but we found people kind of often come to the edges of them because they're not flexible enough to, to kind of modify and maintain. We think by giving you like a low level service environment to write services, but on top of that, a set of open source matchmakers, authentication systems to work from, you can kind of use these to get started very quickly. And from day one, you can be using these things. But when you want to kind of go beyond them and you want to start doing like sort of uh, new things or maybe customizing your matchmaker in a unique way, you can go ahead and do that yourself. So this is some exciting stuff happening. So let's get on to the um, Spatial OS GDK for Unreal. So what's the story behind this? We've, we've had an integration into Unreal for quite a couple of years now. But the philosophy of our early integrations was really just trying to expose um, Spatial OS as kind of networking library into Unreal. So it meant you really weren't able to use the kind of core replication system that everyone like, likes. And when we actually met Josh's team, um, some of the feedback we really got was that they really wanted to preserve that nativeness. Like, it's really amazing in, in Unreal how you can just do some visual programming in Blueprints, tick a box, and literally everything's just networked and wired up automatically for you. And we wanted to try and preserve that, but also add to it the kind of unique opportunities of Spatial in terms of going beyond that single server and doing kind of more crazy stuff. And then the other side as well is kind of unifying um, Unreal as kind of a, uh, as a server environment with the rest of our offering, things like our tooling, our logging, our metrics, all that, all that stuff, and really making like a complete solution. So Spatial OS plus Unreal is basically all you need to build and host and run a modern multiplayer game. 
So it was a cool idea, and we actually started to think about how we can make that possible. And um, this is kind of a diagram of how traditional and real networking works. There's this idea of a thing called a net driver, which is really the part of the system responsible for kind of sending data um, to and from the network. So this runs both on the client and the server side. And on the server side, you end up having like multiple net connections. So you have one for each client. So if 100 people connected, you have 100 net connections happening. And what we tried to do is build a transparent layer, which would preserve all of Unreal's functionality. So all of its clients have predicted character controllers, things like its kind of um, its movement systems, its blueprint system for application, and all that stuff. Um, but make it so you could actually use spatial OS under the hood. So we actually built our own net driver, which conforms to the exact same interface. And as a dev, you barely notice the difference. Um, but the kind of unique thing now is rather than a server having a connection to every single client, as I said before, the server doesn't really connect to clients directly anymore. It connects to spatial OS. So with this net driver, this handles our marshalling. So already you're going to see kind of one big benefit here, which is the server doesn't need to have a connection for each client. So if you have 10 people or 100 people or 500 people connected, the server still has one. And that one connection just goes to spatial OS. It sends the data once to us. And then we do the heavy lifting of actually sending that out to different people. So what that actually means in practice is, because it's so transparent and integration layer, we can take existing games. So this is like the Unreal shooter game. And we've done this at the Unreal tournament as well um, in the office. And you can see we're actually replicating uh, the actor information from Unreal's replication system through spatial. You can see the inspector we were showing you before having actually those objects of dating. You can click on them and view and debug that and diagnose <laughs> that data in real time. And that also means you can now build like analytic systems that hook into that. You can build other pieces of computation that might want to hook into what's going on with Unreal. So it really kind of takes what is quite a, quite a closed like, networking model and exposes it so you can start to do some really, really awesome things with it. So with the integration as well, there are different stages we see people adopting with it. And as you kind of, uh, the early stages are much easier to get started with, but as you kind of go more and more down this kind of uh, journey, you can do more and more with it and, and make more and more kind of crazy things. So the first one is just single server. As I said before, even just having a single dedicated server with spatial, because we're offloading all that networking to our system, that server's freed up to deal with like, uh, you know, being able to do more things like physics, um, more AI, kind of more game logic going on. And especially if you start to have games which have lots of player density. Like if you look at the beginning of a game like PUBG, um, you really have to tone down the simulation because the server is doing so much networking. That's something we can offload and really kind of help deal with. The next step there is still preserving that server, still having a single a dedicated server in Unreal, but starting to offload some of the computationally intensive parts of that. Because you connect into Spatial OS's networking system now, you can start to make dedicated processes for pathfinding or AI or any kind of part of your world which is like unique in terms of uh, maybe like snow deformation or something. Um, and like it's kind of going to, again, save that server's resources so it can do more and more game logic, more and more of its core loop. And then the final thing is this idea of zoning. So this is where you take not just a single dedicated server, for an instance, but you start to have many, you know, tens or even hundreds, all kind of like a patchwork quilt stitched together to make massive game worlds. And if you want to start to scale into kind of thousands of concurrent players and beyond, that's the type of approach you can start to take. And the whole point of the game development kit is, is meant to be like a single solution so you can start to scale throughout those things. And also you can mix and match, because maybe you have some instances where the single server is suitable, and maybe you have larger environments where you need the zoned approach. So as we're saying with all this stuff, it's stuff you can actually get up and download today from, uh, from Improbable if you go to our website. Um, yeah, feel free to actually get in touch. And also, if you want to know more as well, we have all this stuff with live demos down at the booth. So if you go see us, you can actually see some live demos of the inspector and also uh, take the GDK for a spin. And we can show you that the day-to-day -day dev experience is pretty much the same as using Unreal, but it gives you a whole new set of stuff you can go do. So enough from me kind of giving you a high level overview from the, the product side. My favorite thing is to actually have like people like Aaron and Josh actually tell you how they're using this to make uh, actual games. So I'll hand off to Aaron to talk about his project. All right. Thanks everybody. Which uh, button is it to go to the next slide? Right. There we go. Okay. Uh, perfect. So uh, thanks everybody again. Um, I was just reminiscing that uh, a year ago uh, at GDC 2018, I was sitting in this audience uh, having just met the folks at Improbable very recently and uh, was reconnecting with them and then uh, here I am today. So it feels pretty cool to be up here and share with you some of the stuff we're doing using Spatial OS tools. Um, so first of all, I want to emphasize a lot of what I'm going to share. Uh, it doesn't go into the technical details of these things. It goes into much more the, um, the use cases and the things that we're finding as we work with the, uh, with the, with the tools that Spatialist provides. Uh, we are an Unreal Studio as a first-party studio at Improbable. 
So we're using Unreal 4. At the same time, we've been on Spatial since day one. So we've been dog fooding that and getting real good experience uh, using Spatial S and connecting very closely with the London teams uh, to give them feedback on what they're doing at the same time, learning and learning and, uh, and helping to push the tools into further directions. Uh, so today I'm gonna go through four tools that, um, and four ways to use Spatial S uh, that are uh, very straightforward and, and available even today. Uh, their launcher and deployment telemetry, the inspector, simulated, pool, simulated players, and then lastly, a bit more on QBI and how we're using query-based interest. Uh, so first, the launcher. Uh, not a very sexy tool to begin with. Uh, the ability to uh, deploy your game into the cloud and, uh, and then uh, share around links uh, to your other players and other developers who can then download it uh, with, authenti with authentication, with security on that. Uh, and it was amazing when I first, we first started doing this because um, uh, when we built out our studio space, we had imagined that we would need a large server room given that we were going to build an online game uh, and we would have to have all that. And uh, Rob and, and Herman said, well, no, you do all that in the cloud. And I said, well, but there must be somewhere where we do local things and we build things that. And they said, nope, it's all in the cloud from day one. And I thought that was amazing to me. And so the fact that we have all of our space dedicated to developers and uh, everything is seamless and works flawlessly as, it, as our uh, games move up to the cloud and then are taken back down all that work is phenomenal. And so you can see here, we've got uh, examples of different uh, deployments. You can go into the game. A deployment is just an instance of the, of the game on the server. Uh, and then all the kinds of server health you get there on the bottom right, uh, examples of what the processes are doing, what these things. And that, in, that ability to inspect that, the ability to understand that stuff is really helping developers to understand things so they can make better decisions, right? The whole point of all these tools is to make players or give uh, developers chances to make better decisions for the players themselves and, and, and shape the way they do their work. Which leads to the inspector. Um, you saw an example of moving around there and what it could do. Um, this tool blows me away, honestly, when I see this every time. Uh, the amount of data being moved around complex multi multiplayer games is greater than ever nowadays. We know that complexity is one of the things we have to harness, and Spatial OS is a phenomenal way to do that. When you see the inspector and give your developers, uh, and as a developer, you use the inspector in new ways to really understand what's going on in your game, uh, the rate at which you can do things and the rate at which you can make decisions is, is accelerated greatly. Um, I'll give you a small anecdote example. So uh, when we first got involved with this stuff, we built the classic um, rabbits and wolves demo running around this. And uh, at one point, we, we couldn't understand why all these rabbits had clustered together and were all sitting there. And we had no animations like that, so you just, they just aggregated and stood in one spot and we couldn't figure that out. And a quick, uh, quick use of the inspector showed that someone had uh, accidentally uh, amped up their sex drive so much uh, that they were just ramping for each other and wouldn't leave each other. Uh, and, uh, but they were having babies so fast they were starving, and so there was no, you couldn't see the babies being born. So that was something we solved in five minutes as opposed to having to put XML logs and printf statements, all those kind of things like you do traditionally. And it was a nice way to say, wow, it was just a simple matter of mousing over the things, inspecting what was going on in those things and seeing the data there and saying, well, that number's not correct. There you go, that's the answer. So a really nice way to see the inspector working. Um, Again, just having all of your developers run this in a second, uh, second or third screen on their desktop. Uh, it's in a web browser, so it's very flexible, very easy to use. It works on your phone as well, which is uh, amazing to me. Uh, but you can use those tools to see those things. Very, very, what's going on in the game, connect to deployment, and all of that data is available to you so you can uh, make better decisions and understand what's exactly happening with players and developers as they do stuff. All right, that, that leads to simulated players. So we've launched the game. We now have the ability to understand what's happening in the game and see what's going on. Uh, but to really test things, to really load things up, we want to use simulated players. So this is a system that's coming. Uh, we have it on, our, on Unity right now. It's coming to Unreal this year. Uh, but the ability to load up simulated players and really stress things and really, excuse me, ensure that the, uh, the server is getting loaded properly. We all, uh, if you're making a multiplayer game, you want, uh, you, you don't always have hundreds of players sitting around to do things with. So simulated players lets you stress those things and test the boundaries and load things up. Uh, these simulated players are scriptable and, and uh, manageable by you. So you can make them do things that you want to do. You can make them run around. You can make them do things. But they're all designed to give you use cases and help uh, very quickly and easily iterate on your designs and understand what exactly uh, is happening at the margins of your game. Um, you know, we've done as many as 1,000 uh, quite easily in, in using Spatial S. And this particular uh, tool here was essential uh, to Mavericks from Automaton, one of our partners, uh, as they brought out their hunter and hunted mode uh, in uh, Mavericks in February. The ability to understand exactly how their tracking system was, was being uh, used uh, and being able to be tested. Their fake players were leaving um, uh, tracking uh, notices around footprints, et cetera. And so all of the players, the fewer number of players who were actually testing it could see that and then could check to make sure everything was running properly. And so it's a really valuable way to see those things. And that's all built into Spatial as well. 
And then lastly, a bit more on QBI. Um, so this is this is a tool that runs server side, and this is something that lets you do things. Uh, it's really running on the server, but at the same time, my favorite part about QBI is, is just how much it removes from the stress of our developers. So our developers are very technically minded, as, as many are today, but at the same time, uh, they really want to build creative experiences. They really want to do things that are creative in, in mind. And so knowing and trusting that QBI is helping to manage server loads, and helping do things in the background is, a, is, a, is a, a load off their minds and it helps them a ton. So an example here as to how QBI is a use case that we can do really interesting things in. So as QBI then throttles messages from the server to various clients uh, dynamically to ensure that, that things are not being swamped out on the client, but at the same time, uh, you're getting players are getting the absolute uh, right amount of information that they want to get. Uh, a great example would be um, uh, in, a, in an RPG setting, for example, a player might be walking along, might be seeing creatures in the world, uh, and might decide that they've got to uh, pull out their sword and, uh, and attack those creatures. Uh, perhaps for resources, whatever it might be. So uh, at the start of that example, uh, QBI would keep some of those creature updates relatively low because um, they're not necessarily uh, impacting uh, the player's experience. But then when the sword comes out, that can set a trigger, a developer set trigger, which would then, uh, for, for an area around the player, to increase the amount of updates that would happen dynamically and automatically so that now the fidelity of the experience is increased radically and players are going to get the best possible experience if they presumably are looking to go into combat. From there, they can go into combat, have a higher fidelity experience. You know, updates are letting animation sync and letting all that things kind of happen. And then from there, put their sword away. Harvest resources, QBI brings that right back down again. And then when they when they move into uh, to a social space to, to sell those goods or sell those things or trade them, whatever that might be, um, we can also dynamically bring that down as, as hundreds, potentially thousands of players are around. We can create that important um, area of interest around the, around the player. But at the same time, you could also, for example, uh, ensure that guildmates uh, are kept high, and so updates from guildmates might still be high because you want to know exactly what your guildmates are doing at the highest possible fidelity and where exactly they're positioned. And so all that happens automatically, but it's still flexibly. You still have the chance to, to trigger things, to set things up like that, and manage that uh, to yourself, which is a really nice way to do all that. So a bit more about what we're calling Project Edmonton. Terrible name. We have a better code name internally, but we can't share that. Um, you can share uh, a code name. You can say the code name. No, I can't. No, no, I please no, you know, kill me. They'll kill me. It's a code name. All right, it's, it's a code name, but you know, we, we can't. We'll soon. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, so uh, proud to announce that we're building a next generation RPG. Uh, I've made RPGs for almost twenty years of my life, uh, and uh, I'm really proud of uh, the chance to to look forward and think about new RPG experiences we can create. Um, and one of the best things we're doing is taking a lot of the lessons learned from past games we've made, whether they're RPGs or other experiences from uh, the members of our studio, and really trying to think of what we can do in the future using Spatial OS. Spatial OS really is that kind of technology that comes along uh, very rarely in our industry, but it challenges you as a creative developer to, to rethink experiences, to rethink what's possible. Um, everybody in this room and everybody at GDC uh, is, is very privileged to work in this industry and gets a chance to uh, think about uh, things and think forward looking every day. It's not often our day to day, we often spend our day to day in the drudgery of trying to get things accomplished and do things. But Spatial OS really does allow you to do both in better ways. You really get a lot of that um, stuff removed off of your plate and, and, and Spatial OS manages a lot of that day to day stuff while at the same time, it gives you this flexibility and this, this unprecedented power to go and do new things. And so that's the kind of stuff we're doing. Let's think about this. And whether you're a small team, perhaps in the audience here, thinking about what you can do with Spatial OS, small teams really do get, get to build bigger games thanks to Spatial OS. Maybe you're part of a larger team right now uh, that is hoping to, um, hoping to use Spatial OS or thinking about Spatial OS. Uh, Spatial OS provides you a, a fantastic platform upon which to have a, a consistent communication amongst your, your large number of teams, uh, works uh, dynamically around the world, does all that kind of thing. So it really provides uh, even bigger teams that, that uh, ability to connect better and to do things and to make faster decisions uh, because everything gets so much more demonstrable and everything. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about our project, uh, we are recruiting still very heavily. We're almost 50 people right now, uh, but I uh, would love to talk to folks who are interested in the project and love to share more. I've got a few of our team members here in the audience today and there's a few more around GDC. So I'd love the chance to connect to people and uh, share, the, share a bit more about what we're doing uh, privately. So with that, um, I'm gonna share um, introduce Josh Holmes, the CEO of Midwinter Entertainment. Uh, Josh is working on a game that's much further along than ours is uh, and uh, has been using Spatialist as well. And he's going to tell you about the next st stages, what they're doing there. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. 
Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Josh. Uh, I'm from Midwinter Entertainment. Um, I thought what I would do today is, is share a little bit of our journey, who we are, and sort of what led us to Spatial OS. Um, so Midwinter, we're, we're a relatively small studio based in Seattle, Washington. Um, last year, right around this time, we actually announced the partnership with Improbable and started to talk about uh, the journey that we were beginning as a team. Since then, we've grown quite a bit. Um, you know, we've grown from, I think, around six or eight people to uh, now we're, we're starting to get to about 30 people, um, which is right around the, the sort of peak size that, that we're aiming to be for the title that we're developing. Um, our background, many of us come from the Halo team at, at Microsoft, where we work together for the better part of a decade building uh, games like Halo 4, Halo 5. Um, and collectively across the, uh, the talent at our studio, you know, we've worked on uh, a large number of, of different games, mostly in the AAA space. And we're drawing upon that experience as we build uh, our first title together. Um, so as we uh, recently announced at the Game Awards, uh, you know, our first title that we're building is a game called Scavengers. Uh, Scavengers is a survival shooter coopetition um, that really brings together elements of PvE and PvP in a session-based multiplayer experience. And as a team, we are really fascinated by that intersection between um, you know, many, many players in a large-scale open world um, but a world that is alive and dynamic and filled with AI and, and an ecosystem, dynamic weather systems, um, really things that, that bring the world to life in a way that most multiplayer games that are action-oriented, highly responsive multiplayer games just aren't able to deliver. Um, so when we announced the game at the Game Awards, uh, we released a CG trailer that sort of sets up a little bit of the background for the world, and I, I just thought I'd share that with you here today to give you a little bit of context uh, for the game. Yeah, I realize that that's a little bit of a tease, and, and for those of you who are interested in seeing more of the game, we're gonna be uh, starting to show gameplay as we get towards E3 this year. Um, when we announced the game in December, this is the first time uh, after almost a year in development uh, on the title that we uh, had a hands-on with, with PC Gamer, so it was really exciting uh, for us as a team to share. Um, but what I thought I would talk about is, is sort of, you know, what led us um, to the partnership with Improbable. Um, and one of the things as we sort of embarked on this journey to build this game, this, this massive scale world with um, this proliferation of, of dense, reactive, simulated AI, as well as large player counts, um, we were sort of drawing upon the experiences that we'd had in past games. And most notably, we had 
uh, just shipped Halo 5. Uh, Halo 5, for those who, who may not have played the game, um, uh, had a, a mode called Warzone that in, had an intersection of, of PvE and PvP. And one of the biggest challenges for us in trying to represent that mode and that experience was really the challenge of scale, because there's only so much that you can simulate within uh, a single server. And so it was really the promise of, of Spatial OS and the ability to go from that constrained single server approach, as, as Rob was mentioning, um, to then grow beyond that to be able to take advantage of multiple servers um, that really led us to this technology. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned, we're a relatively small team. We're not a, a giant uh, AAA uh, game studio. Um, when, when we were working on Halo, we had literally dozens of people that were working on core components of our networking and our multiplayer systems, um, our tooling and, and all of the sort of engine that went uh, to running our game, uh, the infrastructure there. And that's not something that we as a, as a small team of 30 uh, can afford uh, to, to take on. Um, so really that the promise of Spatial for us is the ability to punch above our weight and achieve something that has a much larger ambition that would otherwise be possible um, with a team of small size. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, you know, as we began uh, the collaboration, one of the things that we really recognized and, and continued to feed back to the Improbable team was, you know, as an Unreal studio, uh, Unreal has this incredible tool set um, that is really the, the core motivation for wanting to take on that engine. And it's an engine that can empower, again, relatively small teams to achieve great things. Um, but inherent in that engine is sort of a, an approach and a paradigm for how you can develop things um, and how things are networked. And that's very deeply ingrained in the way that the engine works. And so it's very important that as developers, we're able to uh, extend from that framework, take advantage of the, the approach that is inherent in Unreal, um, and still be able to leverage all of the capabilities of Spatial OS. And this is what led to the approach of, of the Unreal GDK. Um, you know, as a small team, one of the things that we're thinking of is uh, Scavengers is being designed as a service. It's being designed as a world that will grow and expand over time. Uh, and for us, as we make a decision around, you know, what the foundational underpinning of our of our networking and our multiplayer is going to be, it's really imperative that we have a scalability there, that we have something that we can plug into. And as we add new experiences, as we expand our world and continue to develop and run our game and, and respond to what the community wants to see, that we not be forced to go back to the, the foundation uh, of, our, of our networking and have to make you know, kind of core uh, architectural um, changes um, that might not be possible for uh, a relatively uh, small team such as ourselves. And so, again, that's really the vision of, of Spatial that led us to adopt this as a team. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we, we have started to uh, sign people up for playtesting with our game. We're going to be starting to do external playtests in the next couple of months. For anybody who'd like to participate uh, in that process, and we'd love for you to be a part of the journey with us as a team as we continue to develop this game, um, I'd love for you to go to scavengersgame.com and sign up. Um, and then as we get further along in, in the year, uh, we're gonna be releasing uh, gameplay and, and just continuing to iterate uh, on that foundation. And with that, I'll hand things back to uh, Herman. I just also wanted to just end by just thanking everybody um, and also the panelists here who've done such a great job of conveying their experiences. And, you know, please feel free to kind of come and talk with them and get a candid view of what it's like, not just to work with the tech, but also to work with us as a company. Because I think what we're realizing more and more is this is about relationships. It's about who you trust to work with you for the long term to build something that, you know, you could be spending years of your life on. And from our perspective, you know, we, we've taken these relationships as a profound learning opportunity as well. I think for those of you that have been following us for a few years, I mean, I remember a few years ago when we, we wanted you to code in Scala to write your backend services, right? Um, you know, it's been a long journey for us to get to a place where we are, um, we're as robust and as able to support developers like Josh and Aaron as this. And I think we have a long way to go too. I mean, you saw the V2 sign around our runtime. 
um, you know, watch this space. We're continually developing and going further ahead as well. Um, also, we're also looking ourselves for hiring as well. Um, and one of the things we started to do is to alloy in to the great kind of, you know, X kind of Google, Amazon, Microsoft people we've generally had at Improbable, some really great people from the games industry too. So if folks are thinking of maybe um, seeing what it's like on the other side of the divide, not just making games, but making the infrastructure for them. Um, you know, do come and look us up. We have locations now in lots of places, so we'd love to talk with you. Awesome. Uh, why don't we start with some questions uh, and only troll questions like yesterday, please. Um, only trolls, um, no, no normal questions. All right, um, if anyone would like to ask, please uh, come up to the mic. Hey, we make you come up to the mic. That's a really you know, awkward thing. We should just hand you a mic. Um. Hey, um, I have one question for you is, you said that it's not the kind of thing you would use uh, as a game is finished, like it's something you would start from the get go. Do you have any offers for a game that is already released but is close to the limit of one server? Is there mm -hmm. some sort of, you have any approaches to how you would, you would go to a game that is actually released? Sure, I couldn't quite hear the question. Yeah, so the question was about, um, we're talking about starting from Spatial OS and Unreal together from day one. What's it like if you actually have a game that's already kind of out there in the wild, starting to hit the limits of a single server? Uh, so the core kind of game system is designed so it's kind of relatively easy to port an existing game. So you'll find like a lot of the kind of um, you know, core kind of APIs of Unreal are by and large the same. Anything around like uh, I kind of actor interest and what like sort of uh, what different like sort of actors players see, and um, that's something which you kind of have to move over. But it's something we think within a couple of weeks is something you can kind of move over to. Um, so definitely have a chat with some people on the booth if you have a project where you're looking to be doing that. Sure. Yeah, if I could add um, uh, one suggestion I could have as well is uh, if you've got a lot of assets, you've got a lot of gameplay things, uh, thanks to the GDK, because the developer workflows are very similar, uh, try try a mode. Try building a mode uh, for your with your game uh, and all your game logic uh, on Spatial and see what you can do in that way too. Um, it doesn't potentially answer your, your challenge of flipping out all the back end and turning it into spatial. But I think it would allow you to experiment with and understand just exactly what the what the flexibility and options exist for you are. I think it's worth mentioning the commercial side of that as well, which is um, for some relationships and partners and companies at a certain state of development, uh, we're actually, we have a production team internally. So we're able to work with you mm -hmm. and help you see what boarding would look like. And this is a bunch of very experienced kind of uh, games industry veterans with online backgrounds, producers and tech people who will actually work with you and understand how you operate. Um, so that kind of relationship is possible. Do inquire with us to get there. Also, commercially speaking, some of you might be wondering, you know, what does this cost? We haven't yet been public on prices. We promise that's coming very, very soon. But I wanted to give you a quick understanding of why that's quite favorable. And basically, we're like a giant aggregator of your compute spend. So all we charge for is usage, exactly like a cloud provider. And all we do is aggregate all of the big companies and small developers working with us and go get fantastic deals from cloud providers, which means we're actually able to offer you prices that will seem uh, close to, in some cases, even cheaper than the prices uh, that you would normally just get, get uh, infrastructure from online. So there have been some concern about, you know, what will we charge, how will we do it? We feel like we can be an abstraction that just gives you a very simple one-stop place um, to then get cloud from everywhere, including in places like China, where we're now set up to provide infrastructure very soon. Cool. Uh, other questions? So bright, like the lights. So are bright, wow. <laughs> Literally, we can't see your faces. Hi. Um, you mentioned you already have simulated players. Um, is that just AI or actually connected clients? Uh -huh. Jump in. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's a really good distinction to make. Uh, so I guess the question was about uh, are the simulated players AI or are they kind of connected connected players? So the um, the the answer is that they are they basically act as uh, full and real clients that connect in. Um, but there's an AI controller running and piloting the actual players around. So you can use a lot of the AI systems and real has to kind of go make them. Um, the, it's interesting because there's a question is if you can use those AI to kind of pilot the world around to ex exercise it as a player, could you use the same technique to actually scale up and have AI like offloaded into separate, um, separate compute? And there's a thing there where there's actually the whole point of having players go around a game world is that you have to send them all the data for things around them. And that can be more efficiently done if you were to have one kind of process simulating lots of AI at the same time. So this is actually an active area of research we're looking at about what it's like to potentially offload AI, not just for testing the world, but actually for moment to moment AI and like actual characters and creatures. And, and just because I know I got confused by this the first time around, we mean literally taking an entire executable client and running that in the cloud, representing all of those players. So this isn't just like a fake test. I mean, there are mm -hmm. real like clients running on cloud deployed hardware, connecting in as your clients would. Um, and that service will only get more sophisticated. So that's a really powerful tool that I think even for most multiplayer developers doesn't, doesn't exist even without spatial. 
come forth, mysterious person whose face we cannot see. <laughs> so uh, there's been a lot of talk about game streaming lately, and um, I was wondering if uh, you guys have any plans to collaborate maybe with some of the streaming providers so that you can not only build a game on spatial loads, but also like creep all the benefits of uh, game Absolutely. streaming. I mean, you might have seen we were on the slide deck for Google's presentation um, as a partner, um, and we've been working with Google for a long time. So with streaming, basically, for those of you that are unfamiliar, all you're really doing is taking the client and sticking that in the cloud, almost like our fake players that we've just talked mm -hmm. about now. It's almost exactly the same thing. Um, what's very powerful is that the main limitations on scale with something like Spatial OS, after you've solved all the problems we've solved, are literally just bandwidth and then rendering that's local. So if you could offload the client too, which streaming allows you to do, you could make fairly ridiculous games. And at the same time, to realize the promise of streaming as advertised, so you may have noticed in the talk things like, you know, big distributed physics, et cetera, you need something like spatial to actually take advantage of that compute, um, you know, to then be able to kind of model and distribute the world in an efficient way and leverage existing game engines. So it's a very, very complementary thing. We've been waiting for this for a long time. And, uh, you know, we started like five years ago and we were always hoping that the day would come that this became possible. Thanks. Cool. Personally, I think it'll actually result in new game engines as well um, that, that kind of totally reconsider how to build a game engine and what components go into one, given that you're now going to run it only on the cloud and in specific hardware. Cool. Any other questions? If, if you actually want to just queue up if you have a question, that would be pretty good because then we could, we could jump through. Hi. Um, I was wondering on what are the, some, uh, some of the limitations and solutions on client and server side when a bunch of players do decide to um, come into one area. Ah, the mm. density problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, good problem. Right, does that take that? Yeah, so there's this kind of, um, so the question was, uh, what do you do when everyone goes into one place at one time? It's like the classic question of, of large scale games and it's something you have to really solve. And so there's two kind of parts to that answer. The first one is compute. So it's the fact that if you have loads of people in one place at one time, you've got to simulate all those characters and you know, you, you're going to have to have one process likely, one game engine simulating all of that. The other one, which is the scariest one, which you know scales quadratically and is really complex, is um, if you have like n players in one place at one time, you have to send like n squared messages out to those different players, um, and that can really kind of explode in complexity. So on the kind of uh, on the that side, uh, the QBI feature we talked about before is actually really exciting because you can dynamically adjust those queries. You can actually observe the game world, and when you find density starts to increase, you can actually shrink in the queries both in terms of the rate of updates and in the actual radii of those updates. So you kind of express, you can express something like, oh, I want to see 10 people within this distance of me at this fidelity. So that allows you to kind of actually reduce down the complexity of that problem and you can do that um, adaptively. So, you know, mainly, mainly your day-to-day -day gameplay is actually quite high fidelity, but if you have this monster, everyone goes in one place at one time, you know, you can degrade that networking performance. On the compute side, because you can actually share the compute of a game world across many different servers, that kind of alleviates that um, to an extent as well. But there's always going to be a, a limit to how many people you can put in one place. But the limit with spatial is just a lot higher, um, basically, for most games. Cool. Final question, perhaps? And then otherwise, please come up. We want to make sure we have time for the next sessions. So I was, I was just wondering, do you have any, are there any concerns with the border in between two game worlds? So if you have a mm -hmm. server running a certain part of a game world and another server running another part, and you have two players on opposite sides, is there any, any uh, so I'll let, concerns I'll about let, like latency between them? I'll let Rob answer the question in detail, but just to be clear, this is literally why we made improbable and spatial apps, is like <laughs> that problem, is exactly the problem that we're aiming to make very easy for you. So Rob, you want to jump up? Yeah. Yeah, all my nightmares for the past five years have been around this. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, it's good. They're, they're not happy. They're happy nightmares now because we've, we've solved a lot of problems. Um, so the idea of having two game servers kind of sitting next to each other, uh, you can think of it in, as incremental steps to kind of get to that full seamless world. So the first challenge is how do you see data from another server? Um, so if I'm a player, how do I even see that there's that player on that other server there? So that's something you kind of get out of the box as spatial because we're handling the networking and we're aggregating the data coming in from both those servers and the client connects into us. We can just stitch together almost a composite view of what's happening on each server there. So that, that's cool, tick box. Um, the next one is um, migration. So the fact that if I actually want to run to you and like, you know, like sort of do a melee attack or something, <laughs> Uh, not, not you specifically, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I were to go across a server, um, with, the, with the GDK, we actually have a type of um, annotation on new properties that lets you say that um, when that actor is going to move from one server to another, it's going to preserve that property and serialize it for you. 
Um, and then the final one is interaction across boundaries. And that's, um, you know, there, there isn't really an RPC in Unreal that really expresses the idea of a server talking to another server. So um, with the GDK as well, we're going to be adding that type of RPC, which lets you interact there. And what that does mean is um, your game will essentially be broken out into different zones where you're going to be able to very easily move between those zones and see across those zones. For interaction across those boundaries, which is specifically things like <coughs> shooting or like you know ranged interactions, um, you'll kind of have a new set of APIs you can use to kind of asynchronously interact across it. And um, so th they will feel very similar to like when you do like a, an RPC from a client to a server. So they are asynchronous. Um, but we find actually um, that plus a, a load of common code we're going to give to you to help you with those use cases. It should be pretty straightforward. But it's something you have to think about. And just thank you. Question was on latency and performance as well. I just yeah. wanted to add one other point, which feel yeah. free to throw me off the stage if I get it wrong. But um, basically, everything we've done is to create a situation where you can start building extremely high fidelity experiences. So think like 60 frames a second, physics, gaps exploding. Michael Bay creates a video game, you know, and we need to back that up. A lot, of the, a lot of the compromises in the past, right? And if you could talk, you could talk to some cynical game developers out there in the industry who'll say, ah. I was doing you know, large numbers of players in 1995, but always sacrificing fidelity, always, right? You know, it's always done down time or, you know what, we're gonna make the whole world slow in this particular way. The whole point of spatial, why all the money, the heavy lifting and the time, is to solve this in such a way that actually the resolution of an event across a quite arbitrary topology is A, predictable, which is a hassle in itself, and B, efficient enough, fast enough, and getting faster, if you just don't think about it in the context of a shooting game. So we won't need to do things like tune down the uh, scale of the world or get to 180 milliseconds of latency when there's lots of players in one area. Like we can actually do this right um, because of the foundations we've laid. The, the, the specific thing about latency is the cloud's pretty pretty good. Um, so you're looking at kind of less than a millisecond for a hop between two servers in kind of modern clouds. So with that in mind, it really the, those two servers can communicate really really effectively together. You don't really need to do any prediction of any sorts as well. So it's actually pretty easy and a, a lot easier a challenge than having to do sub to client, which is you got the internet in the way. <laughs> thank you. Um, I think that's all, guys. Um, thank you for all our panelists again.